Meditation actually is in two parts. One is concentration, the other is contemplation. And uh, in a Sanskrit word, Sanskrit meaning, for those who don't know what Sanskrit is, because you come for the first time, it's a classical ancient uh, Indian language. At the time of the Buddha in India, there were so many dialects and a few languages spoken in the country. Uh, the two most common ones were Sanskrit and Pali. Um, now this is in Sanskrit. Um, concentration in the Sanskrit language is Samatha. Contemplation in the Sanskrit language is Vipassana. And as far as concentration is concerned, there's so many ways to train one's concentration. The ways that we use is Anapanasati, the in and out breath. Uh, in and out thinking of the breath. So anapana, in and out, breath. That's the object of concentration that we use. Uh, training one's concentration, you can use so many objects. A candle flame, uh, a bowl of, a big bowl of um, crystal clear water. So many ways in doing it. But the Buddha suggested to us that uh, we use the breath as the object of concentration. Why do we use the breath? We investigate into it. Why? Why do we use the breath? What's the meaning of the breath? So, concentration. So, meditation is not just um, sitting there, uh, you know, feeling relaxed, peacefully, and trying to get into the peacefulness of mind. It is broken into two parts. One cannot contemplate without concentrating. And our mind has been so tricky. Um, it's always, it, it's, it's like a, a desultory rooming of thoughts in our mind. And, and we, sometimes we don't know how we think, why we think. The thoughts just come up, maintaining its status, and then, and then uh, lingering on, changing, and then disintegrating. Our mind is like a monkey. It, it jumps from one branch to another. And sometimes what is even worse, um, our thoughts lead us into erroneous actions and speeches. It get into, we get into sufferings and problems and troubles, all sorts of um, mental afflictions. For the preliminary uh, practitioner, concentration is the initial step that we must go through before jumping to the contemplation. So concentration, samatha. We, the object of concentration we use is anapanasati. We use breath as the object to train our concentration. You need an object to train concentration. You can't just sit there peacefully, quietly. You think you're not thinking of something, but actually our mind is rooming all over the places. So that's what we try to do, concentration. And the object of concentration we use is Anapanasati. Uh, for those who know this, uh, it's a review, so that it, it, it's, it's a meditation in a nutshell. I'm trying to, to summarize everything in here for, for about 45 minutes or half an hour so that we know how and why we meditate. And then contemplation. The, the, another part of it, uh, the Sanskrit word is vipassana. We practice satipatthana. What is satipatthana? The four foundations um, of contemplations. We'll go through it step by step. You've got to be patient with me. You have to go in, in discussing and trying to find out more about meditation. You have to patiently go from one aspect to another. You don't just jump into just sitting there relaxing and getting good health and quietly meditating. That's just the appearance of meditation, not the essence. Try, we have to know the essence, I try to understand why, how, where, and, and when. Now the object of concentration is the breath. 
we focus on the in and out breathing. And usually the problem with people who come, uh, who are beginners, when they come for meditation, uh, they just do what they want. When I say you use breath as the concentration and we start to meditate, they don't follow. They just sit there quietly and peacefully and that's it. They don't faithfully follow the method as we practice because people tend to be egoistic habitually. Why should I follow? Why should I follow your method of concentration? Now what you need to do to come to the Buddhist temple is empty your cup of, of um, self-egoistic understanding, empty all that and try to put in something new. You have to accept before you can practice. Don't just maintain your own view and don't care about, I don't care what you're talking about. I just sit there peacefully. Then you're wasting your time. Try something new. This is what the Buddha told us. So you have to faithfully follow. You use your breath. Don't just sit there and, because I can't read your mind, I don't know how you think. But some people just sit there and they're not following the method. You're wasting your time. If you just sit there peacefully, quietly, you may, you, you may as well do that at home. You don't need to come here. Right? So you have to uh, empty your cup of bigotry, put in something new, and think about it, and practice it. Uh, okay, that's concentration. Contemplation, we practice Satipatthana. What is Satipatthana? Satipatthana, there's a sutra called Maha Satipatthana. It contains all the details of what Satipatthana is all about. It's, it's a long sutra. So you can always research into it later. Maha Satipatthana, uh, the four foundations of mindfulness. Contemplation of the body, contemplation of feelings, contemplation of mind, and contemplation of mind impressions. We have to explain every aspect of the four. We're just doing a summary. Concentration and contemplation, they're like the, the two wings of a bird. In doing meditation, you can't just concentrate without contemplation. You cannot just contemplate. You cannot actually contemplate without concentration. Um, and meditation is not just sitting meditation. Meditation is in every moment of your life. Meditation involves not it's just not just in sitting, in walking, in lying down, in any actions. Every second you are in meditation, you are in control of your own mind. Are we in control of our own mind? Mostly we are not. Most of the time we are not in control of our own thoughts. If you are in control, you won't be angry. If you are in control, you won't be jealous. If you are in control, you won't, be, you won't have anxiety, depression, guilt, Fear, worry, you don't want those. But, it come, but they all come up because you can't control them. You, th you may think that you can control your mind, but actually we are not. We just let our mind going astray. We just let our mind going desultorily, like a monkey, jumping from one branch to another, a branch of greediness at one time, a branch of anxiety at another time, a branch of depression, a, a branch of anger, a branch of greediness. We jump from one branch to another, non-stop. So, this is a general picture of what meditation should consist of. How to meditate. So focus on the breath, as we said. Concentration is focusing on the breath. Remember, that's the object of concentration, not on anything else. Why do we use breath? We're going to, we'll continue to talk about it. And then we say, let go of the sultry thoughts. The contemplation part. Our thoughts have been wandering, roaming, the sultry thinking, and uh, sometimes you don't know why. 
15 minutes ago, we'll concentrate on something, and 15 minutes later, we get angry, we get jealous. We may have daydreams. We may have sometimes even sexual fantasy. We don't know. It, it, our mind roams all over the place, not under control. Sometimes you may think you control it. You can control it for a few minutes and then it's gone. Focus on breath. We call it present moment awareness. How present? What is the most present in you? The breath is the most present moment. It's not yesterday's breath. It's not breath of the last minute. It's the breath now. If you cannot maintain your present breath for a short time, you're dead. Why the breath? Why do we use the breath? Your breath is the most present moment. It follows you wherever you go and as long as you live, non-conceptually. Because every thought is more or less conceptual. But the breath, you do not, you do not have to conceptually think about your breath before breathing. It just comes naturally. It's non-conceptual. Anything that's conceptual is bias. You put your concept into it. You put your ideas into it. You put, put your personal judgment into it. Your internal commentator in you always put judgment on everything. But your breath is non-conceptual. You don't have to think about it to bring your breath along. But your breath reminds you to be aware of your body, aware of your present situation. Are we aware? What, what's the pur purpose of meditation? Is to let ourselves be aware of our own thinking so that we put our thinking in the most meritorious way, the most beneficial way, the most meaningful way. And the breath is easy to remember and control. Can you control your breath? Yes, unless you're suffering from a cold, unless you have sickness that you can't control your breath. You don't have to remember to breathe. It's natural to you. It is the most akin to you as a focus object. It's the closest to you. What is more close than your own breath? It's even closer than your skin, your hair. It is inside. So if you don't use the breath, what do you use? You use a candle flame? What happens if the wind blows out a candle flame? So what is the most closest to you? It's the breath. So intelligently, the Buddha suggested to us that in getting an object of concentration, get the breath as the object of concentration. And also it seems to be systematic because it leads you to come back. Your breath is gone, then it comes back again, it's gone, it's come back again. It's like a monkey. Our monkey mind is going all over the place and then we put our, our monkey onto a leash. And then when it wanders away, you leash it back. You, you, you pull your monkey back when it wanders away. Your monkey is nonstop. Sometimes greediness, sometimes jealousy, hatred, anger, depression, anxiety, guilt. You name them. Many, many mental afflictions. The monkey of mental, mental afflictions. Sometimes your monkey may feel happy. Sometimes your monkey is compassionate, kind. But to most people, most of the time, the monkey is going astray in the wrong way. So, that's the breath. That's why we use the breath. So when you sit here, faithfully follow that. Don't just sit there doing nothing and, and just dozing away in your sleep. You're wasting your time. You have to faithfully follow your breath. It's not easy. You try it out later. 
Now, after, after this talking session, we're going to practice it, and you know how difficult it is to follow your breath. You may, you may be able to do it for three minutes, or sometimes even five, and then it goes away. You can't even concentrate on your own breath for five minutes. You try it out, you know later. And sometimes we think, and, and most, many, many medical doctors would think that way, meditation is good for people who suffer from ADHD. Because you can't control yourself in ADHD. You have to be act, always active. And now, you are residing in, 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 internally and try to calm down. Okay, that's focus on the breath in simple English, simple words. Next, let go of the sultry thoughts. What does that mean? That is more on the vipassana side, the contemplation side. And some people call it insightful meditation. That meditation, it, sometimes you come in English, people would like to use focus and insightful concentration. Con insightful meditation. Not just focusing. Focus, you don't need insight. But in contemplation, you need insight. You, not, you need wisdom. So focus is not, it's, it's more or less not, not involved with wisdom, but contemplation is involved with wisdom. The more contem the higher the contemplation, the higher the wisdom. In the Buddhist term, it's called prajna. It's the Sanskrit language, it's prajna. Um, a very high understanding of life, of reality. Prajna is, is a Sanskrit word. Um, it's a very high level of understanding. So break the habitual perpetuation of attachment. How do we attach? We're attached to many things. We're attached to fame, wealth, many, many things we're attached to. Sometimes we're attached to anger, to jealousy, to greediness, to hatred, or even something we like. We're attached to love. We're attached to a, a marriage that was broken 20 years ago. We're still attached to, attached to the agony of it or attached to the happiness of it. We always attach. Some people are attached to drugs, alcohol. So how do we break the per habitual perpetuation of attachment? Why do we have to let go? The breath deals with the present. And how about the past? Yesterday's agony, yesterday's love, yesterday's happiness. We always bring, bring yesterday's agony onto the present table and, and think about it and get depressed with it. Something passed away many, many years ago. Occasionally, we bring it back on our present table, ponder on it and cry about it, and a lot of behavior is created out of it. So the breath deals with the present, the past and the future, and we worry about the future. We always worry about the future. It hasn't come yet, but we think as if it's already here. Worries, anxieties. But the future hasn't come yet. You're worrying you are sick. But by worrying about it, will the sickness improve? It won't. But we habitually get worried about the future. That's a trap. We got, get stuck in it. Nobody else can get you out of it because you are habitually doing that all the time for many, many years. Some old and broken habit that is very difficult to eliminate. Halt the habitual egoistic self-thinking pattern that is causing sufferings. The ego in us, we call it the manas. We have eight consciousnesses, what we've been talking about. Our consciousness is not just one. It has eight consciousnesses. That we, just, just to review, the I consciousness, 
the ear consciousness, the taste consciousness, the touch consciousness, the auditory consciousness, and then we have the six, which is the mano consciousness. That is what the thinking consciousness is all involved in. And finally, the what? The manas consciousness, which is the ego consciousness. We always attach the ego to our thinking. How does it benefit me? How do I differentiate myself from you? And finally, there's of course the eighth consciousness, which is the alaya consciousness. That is the banking storage consciousness that store all the energy, that store all the karma from previous life and store all the karma of the present life too. That is the alaya consciousness. That's just like the, the uh, unlimited memory of the computer. Everything you key in, everything you key in, it won't go away. It's right in the memory. You think you can get away from doing something bad? No, you can't get away. So the alaya consciousness store everything. So we have to be responsible for every thought. Don't let bad thoughts come up in you. You think of thought, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't um, bring my thought into action, into speech, so I'm okay. No, every thought has energy. The Buddha said, when you practice meditation, you start with the thought, not with how you sit. How do you cross, people, people usually in meditation, they always ask, how do I cross my leg? How, where do I put my hands to? How do I, how the body should behave? That's not important. The most important is your thought. We usually say, if you maintain the same thought, always thinking that way, and if you habitually maintain that thought and carry it into action, that becomes your personality. And the personality would de determine your destiny. So how do you change your destiny to be better, to improve? Change not just the action, not just the speech. Start with a thought. Change your thought. So that's how, that's how to meditate. You focus on your breath. That's what the Buddha said in Anapanasati. Uh, let go of the sultry thoughts. That's what the Buddha said in Mahasatipatthana. So these are the two uh, most important aspects of meditation. By the way, some people call meditation, not meditation, not samatha, not vipassana. They call it consciousness therapy. Consciousness therapy. When we get sick, we get medicine, right? We get therapy. When the mind gets sick, you can't just med use medication to stop it. You have to heal your mind. Healing the mind is just as medication. Medication is just to cut it, to stop it, without healing the roots, not looking at the roots of the problem. Strictly speaking, many, um, many Bodhisattva says, we are all sick. We are all sick in the mind. That's why we are reincarnating. Do you recognize that we are all sick? Why do we get angry? Anger is a sickness. Why do we get jealous? Jealousy is sickness. Why do we get depression? Depression is surely a sickness. How do we heal it? Not just by medication. Get into the roots. Understand our own mind. That's the basis of medication, of, of, of meditation. Meditation is to research and investigate into our own mind. Not just getting blessings from an external source. If, only, if you can get healed 
just by blessings from an external source, and if that external source is all compassionate, He would have healed you already without asking. If there is an all compassionate God, nobody will be suffering because He would have healed you without even you asking. You have to work and cultivate yourself on enlightenment. Even the Buddha said, I cannot enlighten it for you. You have to walk the walk, just not just talking about it. The Buddha can only give us guidance. Can the teacher write an examination for you? Can the teacher say, I can write an examination for you and you get an A? You have to write your own exam. You have to study it. The teacher can study it for you. The teacher can only give you the guidance and the instructions and how to do it. He can't do it for you. So if you just say, I want blessings from God. If God is all compassionate and all promising, you don't even have to ask because you know what you need. You can be as God as he is. But you have to work it out yourself. Don't wait. Don't wait for the next reincarnation. You know, we are all in samsara, you know. We're all in life and death. After this body is gone, after we died, everybody has to die. Who don't have to die? You raise your hands. Raise your hands. I don't have to die. You don't have to die? Your body has to die. Your eternal life may not have to die. But your, this body is just an apartment. As we always mention, this body is just an apartment, a rented apartment on a, on a, on a lease. It's a net, net lease. You have to furnish it, you have to look after it. And it has a period. It has a term, a term of at the most 100 years. And then you have to get out, you have to check out. You check in and you check out. Sometimes you think our body is just like a hotel. You check in in your mother's womb, you get born, and one day you got to check out. There's no exception. You can't say, I don't want to check out. No, you have to check out. And during this period of 100 years, when you're living in your apartment, what do you do? Are you creating more bad karma for yourself? Why are we coming, why are we coming into this samsara? We call it samsara. It's, it's a Sanskrit word, samsara. S-A-M-S-A-R-A. -A -A. Samsara is life and death. Life is not just one-time deal. When, when the Buddha looked at the time horizon, is three time is in three aspects the present the past and the future just like everybody will look at the time time they look at these three time dimensions the present moment the past moment and the future moment but as an individual as a sentient being our time horizon is very limited the buddha's time horizon is much more wider when we, when, when we talk about time, we only talk about yesterday, two years ago, three years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, or the time when we were a baby in the mother's womb. That's the most. We never thought about previous life. People say, who cares? I don't know. But the Buddha said, every sentient being has previous lives. And then, the time dimension of the, of, of the future is not just tomorrow. One day, one, one day, two days, one year, two years, it's the next life. If you have been creating a lot of karma, you'll reincarnate into the next life. If you're not enlightened, after this body is due, I mean, after this lease is terminated, you're going to go into another lease. You're going to go into another hotel. 
Fortunately, because of your karma that you created in your previous life, you have been creating good karma in your previous life most of the time. For example, you, have, you had been in your previous life a philanthropist. You have been very compassionate. You, you're very responsible. You are a hero. You only work for the benefit of the country. You are the best person. Then you reincarnate into this life and you are, you are enjoying life because you, you created good karma in your previous life. You're rich, you're healthy, not without reason. You cultivate your own plans. It matures. So you're responsible. You enjoy the good karma that you've done in previous life. On the other hand, you could suffer from the bad karma you created in your previous life. What if some people get richer than you? Why are some people more handsome than you? More beautiful than you? Why are people, some people stronger? And why, why do they have a good family? Why do they have a, you have a broken family? Or you have a good family and they have a broken family? Why, why are the destinies of everybody a difference? Not dictated by God. You, you what? You perform your own karma in your previous life. And you, bat, you, you, brought, you brought your karma, good or bad or neutral, into this life. And everybody's karma is different. And usually the sutra says, if in this life you are, you are very beautiful, for example, some sutra says, you have been practicing endurance in your previous life. You always smile. You can always endure with difficulties. You're always respectful of people. You always talk in a very skillful way. And when you react with people, you always make people happy. And in this life, your, your facial features, as a result, will be more prettier. Everything has causality. There's a reason for it. And why are some people so rich in this life? Billionaires? They have been a philanthropist in a previous life. They donated their whole estates to help out the poor. And this is what they enjoy, and the riches. Imagine if you, if, if, if you loan some money out, there's interest. And after so many lives, the interest in, in, incur into it, you're enjoying your own riches. So actually, what you give out, you get in return. You don't think that I give out, I don't have it, I, I forsake it, I got, I got no money left. No, it comes back to you multifold. You give out a dollar, it may come back to you in ten dollars, in many, so many ways. When, but when we give out a dollar, we don't think, I want it to come back in, ten, in, in, in a million. No, you don't think about that way. Otherwise, you're attaching to it. So everything has causality. An effect comes out, there must be a cause for it. Why are you coming for meditation today? Do you come for no reason? Are there causes that lead you to come to meditation today? Don't tell me that I don't have a cause. There must be causes. So, we're talking about the time horizon. Uh, I'm, I'm diverting to another way. I'm, I'm talking about samsara and about reincarnation, about life and death. Um, if we don't do something about it in this life, if we, don't pref if we don't go through what the Buddha suggested to us, to go through the spiritual transformation that Buddha suggested, we'll roll into the next life with our present karma. The Buddha, 2,600 years ago, he ended his habitual body and get into this nirvana. No more reincarnation, no more samsara, no more life and death. He's, he's, he's gone beyond life and death. And he introduces ways to get beyond life and death. Don't get into reincarnation anymore. We don't even know. We don't know what would be the, our next life. We don't know. And according to some sutras, it says, Usually, the next life is going to be worse than this because of what you have done in this life. What you have done in this life, you know. 
killing, lying, slandering, sexual misconduct, stealing, greediness, hatred, anxiety. And sometimes we're compassionate, we're helpful, we're beneficial. But how much of it is good and how much of it is bad? You probably know more than I do because that's what you did. So, getting back to, I have more to say about reincarnation samsara, but let's get on to the topic, otherwise I'll be rooming like a monkey all over the place. So, let's get into how to meditate. Meditation. Focus on breath and let go. Follow it faithfully. Don't just sit there and not following it. As I said, we use the breath our, uh, as our object of concentration. When you're sitting there, not, not using that, you're wasting your time. You may as well be relaxing at home. Why do we have to come here? If you're not following the instructions as practiced by the Buddha, which I introduced to you. Now, our senses, let's go faster. This is our external sales lady. In our body, it's like a company with external staff. Our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue, our body are the external staff of this body company. They are interacting with externalities. And in the process of, of interacting with externalities, we attach, we interact, we perform. Imagine if you don't have these senses, how can you, how can you interact with externalities? When you, when you interact with externalities, you carry out speeches and actions which brought you karma. So in order to, uh, to, to meditate, you have to, you have to stop your externalities for a time because when your externalities are interacting with, when your senses are interacting with externalities, you are attached. So eyes attached to matter. When we say matter, anything that is made up of molecules, protons, electrons, all this is matters. I see objects. So eyes interacting with all objects, all matter, all things that they can see. Ears with sound, nose with smell, tongue with taste and body with touch, tactility, bodies with touch. And this touch also means the interaction of the body inside, the organs, everything. So the, the, your, your internal organ is also interacting, not just the external eyes, ears, nose, tongue. So everything, everything about your body, you are interacting with all these matter, sound, smell, taste, and touch. No exception. Your eyes cannot listen, only your ears can. Your ears cannot see, only the eyes can. Your eyes cannot taste, only the tongue can. And then you also have the mind, which is the thinking mind, interact with all the thoughts that's created in the mind. That's the internal reaction. And then there's the manas, which is the self. You always have this self in you that grabs onto habitual thinking. In meditation, what do we do? Because when, when we're not interacting, when, when we're not meditating, our senses are interacting, like you're interacting with me, you're looking at me, you're listening to me. But in meditation, you're trying to purify that. You're trying to stop those externalities for a while and go into the internal peacefulness and tranquility of the mind. So in other words, you cannot have factory production sound all vibrating into your ears and meditating. No, you cannot do that. Or you cannot have a show going on and you look at the show, entertaining show, and then you have a meditation. You can't do that. When you're eating, you cannot meditate, right? So you have to shut off all these externalities that disturb your mind, that not disturb, that interact with your mind. So how do you do it? You have to let go of matter. When you close your eyes, you let go of matter. So when you are meditating, you don't open your eyes and try to look at who is in here and who is not. So you have to close your eyes so that your eyes are not interacting. Because when your eyes are interacting, how can you meditate when you are watching television? You cannot. So you have to let go of, I, I'm, I'm letting go of attachment to, to colors, to TVs, you know, 
everything. I want to meditate. I want to go internally within. So you have to let go, close your eyes, let go of matter. So that's the reason why when you're meditating, you're closing your eyes, right? You can't open your eyes and meditate. How about the ears? You have to let go of the sound. You cannot listen to radio. But we have yet more to say about letting go of sound. Because when you're meditating, sometimes you cannot, you cannot let go of the snoring of the guy who's meditating next to you. Because you're sleeping. So you still can listen to the sound. So you have to let go, you have to let it flow out from the other ears. In other words, you cannot attach to the sound produced surrounding you. You have to let go of that. You need training to do that. Nose, smell, you have to let go of the smell. That guy who is meditating next to you is sweaty. He just jogged for one, one hour and he, he stinks. So you have to let go of the, of the smell. You can't attach to the smell. And now about the taste. You have to let go of that. You're not eating a hamburger when you are, when you are meditating. Can you, can you bite into a hamburger when you're meditating? You're not, not, you're not, you, you're not letting go of the, of, of, of the pickles, of, of, of the hamburgers, of the lettuce in the hamburger. So you have to let go of your taste. And body, you cannot let go. Because your body, the touch is the breath. The breath, the in and out breath still touches your nose. So you only have the breath, which is the object of, of, of concentration, left. No more matter, sound, smell, taste, but there's still a tactility, the touching of the breath in and out. That's the only object of attention that you should, you should still have. And how about thought? We have to go deeper into that. Attention on present breath, live your present moment here and now, no internal commentator, because everybody has an internal commentator. You always put comments, egoistic self-comments on everything. We stereotype, we label things. This is good, this is bad. This, this, this guy looks ugly. This guy looks handsome. You always attach your internal commentary on everything you see, everything you listen to, no exception. You have to break that habitual continuation of the sultry thinking of the present, past, and future. That's very difficult. Well, I'm only giving you a summary of what we should do. Self, let go, only in and out breath exist. So meditation is to let go of many things. Can you let go of these? If you can't let go, you may as well leave. You don't need to. I can't let go of sound. I can't let go of yesterday. I can't let go you know, of many things. Why are you sitting here? You're wasting your time. I want to open my eyes when I'm meditating to see this is color, this is a good color, this is a hall. I want to listen to snoring. I mean, how can you meditate? So, so, so many things you have to train yourself to let go. The only focus of attention, the breath, is still there. And the, the magic of using the breath is, by concentration, by concentrating on the breath, you automatically let go of matters that you see, of sound that you listen to, of the smell that you taste, uh, uh, that you, your, your nose breathe, and of the taste that your tongue is tasting. So in other words, when all your concentration is on the breath, I'm breathing in. The air is coming in cool. It touches my nostril. Now it gets into my body. And then it, it lingers onto the body and it comes out. When it comes out, it's warmer than it comes in. I feel it, I feel it. Then all your concentration is on the breath. And when that concentration on the breath lingers on, magic comes. The power comes. Because you have a, a span of concentration which you don't have, you may not realize it. You don't have the concentration. The higher the concentration that you have, the higher the power of tranquility, the higher in the cultivation of wisdom. That's the reason why what determines a bad student and a good student? A good student has to have a long span of concentration. 
He can concentrate on reading a few pages. A bad student even can't concentrate in a paragraph. A successful student is always a student with a higher concentration. A good employer is always, employee is always a worker who can concentrate on his work. So concentration gives power. It's just like when you put a lens, a magnifier under the sun, you focus that light onto the lens, it burns whatever is underneath it. You, can't, you cannot move, you don't, have, you, don't, you don't move your lens. You just stay put, stand still, focus, and then it burns whatever is underneath. It gives you power. Concentration gives you the power. There goes the saying, whatever the mind can concentrate on, the mind can do. That's the attitude of many positive thinkers. Dale Carnegie. Carnegie, oh, I forgot that name. Um, positive thinkers. Whatever you concentrate on, and you concentrate long, wholeheartedly, you carry it out, good or bad. You're concentrating, if you're concentrating on bad behavior, you're going to be a criminal. If you're concentrating on compassion, you're going to be a bodhisattva. If you're concentrating on spiritual transformation, you're going to, you carry it with perseverance, you're going to be a Buddha. You're going to transcend life and death, transcend samsara. So concentration is the first step in meditation. If you can't even concentrate, don't talk about meditation. And concentration is not only helpful for you to be a saint, for you to go through the spiritual transformation. Concentration would make you successful in whatever you are doing. But watch out, don't concentrate on bad behavior. Concentration gives power. And if that power, that concentration is combined with contemplation, with the right wisdom, you will be a saint. So concentration has to be put in the parameters of righteousness. So if you're a bad guy and you have a high power concentration, then you are Hitler. You know, Hitler? Bad enough. All those followers of Hitler, nasty, they are concentrating in doing one thing, but in a bad way non-human way. So it's very important that your concentration is put in the parameters of compassion and righteousness. That we have to study. You think you learn all Buddhism just in this course? Just for the morning? There's a lot more to know about. I'm going to only give you a brief summary in a nutshell. Contemplation. Vipassana. What does, Vipassana is a Sanskrit word. What does it mean? Pazana. What does Pazana mean? Vit, vit is only a prefix of the word. Pazana. Pazana means perceiving, insightful perceiving. Pazana is insightful perceiving. Vit is what? Vit is in a special way, cutting through it, going through it thoroughly. Going through the perceiving thoroughly with wisdom. That's vipassana. In the Vimala Kriti Sutra, there's a sutra called Vimala, Kasutra, Vimala Kriti Sutra. Manstri Sri, Bodhisattva asked Vimala Kriti, Upasaka, a question. How does one practice in order to get rid of mental afflictions? We all have mental afflictions, no exceptions. We all have mental afflictions. Vimala Kriti answer. One must meditate with the right contemplation. What is this right contemplation? What are the parameters involved? What's the standard for, for, for being right? We don't know what is right and what is wrong. That's why we get into trouble. John, a teenager, he does not know what is right and what is wrong. He needs to be guided. 
by the right teacher, by the right parents, right? Even though he knows how to concentrate, he's a genius. He knows how to concentrate. But without guidance, the right guidance, he could be a genius in the wrong way. We've got to guide that geniality gen into the right path. That's what Buddhism is all about, to guide concentration in the right path, in the right way. And there's a lot to study in it. Open that treasure house. Because of this mass communication, we can always get information from a lot of sources, try to get into what this treasure house of Buddhism is all about. Don't just look at the entertaining aspect of your computer. Got talents, entertaining. Everybody spent hours into, into entertainment. But would you spend half an hour to understand Buddhism, to know what this treasure house is all about? Open that door and venture into it. It's, it's exciting. It's just like when you're meditating, some people say meditating is boring, you know, it's quiet. But meditating is like looking into your inner world of your mind. And when you open that inner world, you will find a lot of mystery in it. You don't even, you can't even imagine. The more you get into it, the more you find. And some people, when they get into the, 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 the deep part of it, they could even find their previous life information. But that's not the purpose of meditation. So in other words, everybody has that supernatural power in your consciousness. You just haven't found it. And it's interesting to find it. It's more interesting to go to the pub to get a drink because What's the purpose of getting a drink? Get yourself intoxicated. But in here, when you're looking in internally, meditating, you actually get into the inner world of you. Do you want to understand more about yourself? It's very interesting. You have never attempted to open that door of you. Open it. Get into it. You'll find more and more about yourself. inscrutable. It's a lot of treasure inside. On the other hand, you could find a lot of trash inside. When you open that, that big box, that big box of mental afflictions that you have stored in there, your jealousy, your hatred, your greediness, your depression, all stored in there waiting for you to clean it up. What is meditation? Part of the meditation is to clean up your garbage. Don't you have to clean up your garbage, this, the garbage in yourself? You don't think you have a lot of garbage? I know I have a lot of garbage in myself. I have been building up greediness since many, many lifetimes ago. My greediness, my hatred, my depression, my guilt feeling, my anxiety. Meditation, part of it is to swab it out, clean up your garbage. They stink. The more you clean it up, the cleaner you are. Nobody can clean it for you. Nobody can, nobody can clean up your garbage for you, not even the Buddha. If the Buddha can help you and clean up all your garbage, he would have done so if he's all compassionate. What's the definition of all compassionate? Without you even you asking, he already have done it for you. Uh, all compassionate Buddha would not, be, would not be thinking this way. I am the Buddha. You come for me to help. You come to me for help. Then I help you. No. He would have given you what you, don't, you haven't even perceived. This is my last slide for the session. I, I, I skip a lot because I don't have time. I said, we're meditating. We're concentrating. We have contemplation. And we need the right parameters to put our meditation in. So in other words, 
if you are a meditator, if at the same time you're not guided by the right, the right approach, you could be directing your meditation into the wrong way. So the Buddha said, everybody's meditation has to be guided by the right parameters. And these are general framework of all the parameters that we should know. So in other words, if you're always involved in sexual misconduct, and you meditate every day, you think you'll be successful in becoming enlightened? You're doing the wrong behavior on the one hand, and you're meditating on the other hand. You are drinking poison on the one hand, and you are getting, you are getting nutrition on the other hand. Poison and nutrition, they contradict each other. So if you're getting nutrition, like what a, what, a, what a meditation is all about, on the other hand, you're not taking poison. If you have bad behavior, you're taking poison. So these are the parameters. So the three components of the Buddhist practice, moral virtue, in the Sanskrit word is sila, in the Pali word is also sila, meditation, in the Sanskrit, uh, it's, in Pali, it's, it's samatha or, sam or samati. Insight, wisdom, in the Sanskrit language is prajna, in Pali is bhana. Now these are the three uh, division, threefold division of the Buddhist practice. So if you practice meditation, at the same time you must have moral virtue. So in other words, you're always meditating, but you are always involved in sexual misconduct. You can never be successful in meditation. You're involved with killing, you're involved with lying, you're involved with the wrong behavior. It does not matter how you meditate. You could be a master in, in concentration, but if your moral virtue is bad, you will never get enlightened. As a matter of fact, you will get into more and more mental afflictions. So you have to be guided. The, the first step in meditation is you gotta have sila. You gotta have a high moral conduct. You, have, you all have to learn what is the, what is the definition, what is, what is contained in what the Buddha was talking about, immoral, immorality, immoral virtue. So we always say, some people want to say, I want to become a monk. For the first five years that you are in, in a monastery, you learn nothing. You learn only sila, how to be virtuous, morally virtuous. So in other words, you have to stop all your bad behavior, your bad speeches to start with. So that's the first requirement, moral standard. Second requirement is concentration. The third requirement is wisdom level. And all these have to be in the parameters of the, eight, the noble eightfold path. Right speech, right action, right livelihood, right efforts, right mindfulness, right concentration, right understanding and right thought. All these are in the Buddhist sutras. They all have to be studied to understand it. So I'm only giving you a nutshell, Buddhism in a nutshell. You really have to go deep into the, the Eightfold Path to know, other than meditation, these are the parameters I use to guide my meditation, to guide my mindfulness, to guide my wisdom. It's just like John is a genius, but you need to guide him in the right way. Otherwise, he could use his ingenuity into misbehavior. You have to guide him in the right way. So these are the guidance.